This is Space Time Series 21, Episode 84, for broadcast on the 24th of October, 2018. Coming up on Space Time, the number of known fast radio bursts doubles. Pippi Colombo blasts off on its mission to explore the mysteries of the planet Mercury and why Earth's rotational axis is drifting. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have just doubled the number of known fast radio bursts, mysterious millisecond flashes of powerful radio waves from deep space. Scientists still don't know what's causing them, but they involve an incredible release of energy, equivalent to what the sun produces in 80 years. A report in the journal Nature claims the new discoveries include the closest and brightest fast radio bursts ever detected. The study's lead author, Dr. Ryan Shannon from Swinburne University, says the detection of 20 additional fast radio bursts provides good solid evidence that they're coming from the other side of the universe, rather than from our own galactic neighbourhood. To undertake the observations, Shannon and colleagues used the CSIRO Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder. The radio telescope comprises an array of 36 identical 12-metre dishes in outback Western Australia. These 36 parabolic dishes can work as a single instrument with a total collecting area of around 4,000 square metres. The telescope is a field view of 30 square degrees. That's 100 times larger than the full moon. And by using the telescope's dishes in a radical way with each pointing at a different part of the sky, astronomers can observe some 240 square degrees of the sky at once. That's about 1,000 times the area of the full moon. The observations show the bursts are travelling for billions of years and occasionally travelling through clouds of gas. Each time this happens, the different wavelengths which make up a fast radio burst are slowed by different amounts. Eventually the burst reaches Earth and its spread of wavelengths arrives at the telescope at slightly different times. Timing the arrival of the different wavelengths tells scientists how much material the burst has travelled through on its journey thereby telling us something about the intergalactic medium between us and the radio burst. Shannon says despite now knowing that fast radio bursts originate from around halfway across the universe, scientists still don't know what's causing them or which galaxies they're coming from. He says the team's next challenge will be to try and pinpoint the locations of bursts on the sky to localise them to better than a thousandth of a degree and good enough to tie each burst to a particular galaxy. Fast radio bursts or FRBs as we call them, are a great cosmic mystery. They're these short split-second durations of radio waves. They have an unknown cause. We don't really know what produces them. What we do know is that they occur often, but rarely found, because telescopes that see them can only really see a narrow patch of sky. So we think that hundreds or thousands are going off across the entire sky every day. But because our telescopes have typically had very narrow fields of view, we haven't seen that many. So one of the key questions about FRBs is how far away they are. And to figure this out, what we need to do is find more by looking over as wide a field of view as we can to find the most extreme examples. And that's sort of what you guys have been doing. You found a, a whole heap more. Yeah, exactly. So what we did is we decided to use a telescope called the Australia Square Columbia Ray Pathfinder, ASCAP. It's an array of antennas. There's 36 antennas. They're each 12 meters in diameter and this in the regional Western Australia. Each of the antennas is equipped with this innovative CSIRO-designed phased array feed, which is like effectively a radio camera. And this really allows us to widen the field of view. Each dish can see 36 different patches of the sky. Now compared to older technology, which could only see one patch of sky. So we've really been able to widen the field of view and we're able to discover 20 fast radio bursts this way. Before we started our searches, only 27 had been found. And at this stage, have you had a chance to try and determine where in the sky those fast radio bursts are in relation to other cosmological objects? Uh, We've had a first crack of it. For this first experiment, what we did is we pointed all the antennas in different directions, and we call this a fly's eye search, because just like a fly's eye can see in all kinds of different directions. So this really widened the field of view. When we use the telescope in this way, we are unable to figure out exactly where the bursts are coming from. We know to where they're coming from to within like a tenth of a degree. However, that's not really good enough to tell you what the host galaxy is for these bursts. However, what we're able to see is another fingerprint of how far away they're coming from. And that's through this process called dispersion. What's happening with the dispersion is that the radio waves that are bluer 
uh, arrive a bit before the radio waves that are redder. What we found is that the reason this is the case is that the radio waves are traveling through faint, diffuse, what we call intergalactic medium. And what we found is that the bursts that ASCAP has detected are coming from a bit closer than the bursts detected by Parks, which is a previous record holder for fast radio burst detection. And this is telling us, in fact, that the bursts are indeed coming from huge distances, billions of light years from Earth. So definitely out of our galaxy a long, long way yeah. away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One of the, the, the rules, one of the questions before we started our study was uh, how far away they were. And what we found is that the bursts that we see are way more intense than the bursts that previous searches have seen, just because our, our dishes are smaller, so they're just less sensitive. The fact that they're more intense relative to the previous ones and the fact that they have less of this dispersion signature than the previous ones is really telling us that the matter that's imprinting this dispersion is not matter that's inside galaxies, but that's in between galaxies. And this can only be the case if the bursts are coming from such large distances. Can you start to hypothesize what's likely to be causing these bursts? I take it, yeah. I take it none of them have repeated themselves. They've always been single bursts. Yeah, that's, that's very... It's very interesting. Uh, the best studied burst source has been the one that has repeated, and that's allowed a, a great deal of uh, intense study of it. The way we did our searches is, is that we pointed the antennas at the same positions of sky day after day. So we looked at the same regions over and over again, days entering into weeks and turning into months. So for some of the burst positions where we found the burst, we had actually looked at them for 30 days and we hadn't seen any repeats. So that's very much different than this repeating source. As to what causes these bursts, that's still an open question. But one thing we know now, because of how intense the bursts are and from how we now have an approximate distance to the burst sources, we know that there's a lot of energy in them, that these bursts can have in radio waves the same amount of energy that the sun produces in weeks to months to years to decades. So there's an incredible amount of energy in these bursts, and that's going to make us theorists, uh, you know, physicists who try to make models for these things, they're going to have to scratch their heads. Yeah, because normally when you think of something like that that's only occurring yeah. once, yeah. you think, well, maybe this is a, a supernova or something like that. There are more energetic explosions, that these things called gamma ray bursts. Gamma ray bursts, supernova. Yeah. And supernova are very are, are very uh, energetic. The difference here is that all the emissions coming out in radio waves, and that's very different than these other these other events. Uh, what's also also different is the event rate. As I mentioned earlier, we think that over the entire sky, the bursts are happening, you know, hundreds to thousands of times per day. Versus, we know supernova explosions don't happen that frequently. Well, so well, there's, there's once a century in our galaxy. Oh, once a century in our in our Milky Way, and then if you you know count all the galaxies out to where we can we think the these fast radio bursts are coming from, you can't really score off the rate. Yeah. So that, that, that makes them different. The other thing is that, is yeah, just the, the amount of emission that's coming out in the radio waves. We see sources with sort of similar flavor of emission from our own galaxy. These are pulsars. However, these uh, bursts that we see from fast radio bursts are a trillion times more energetic than the pulsars. So it seems like it's a bit of a stretch to turn a pulsar into a fast radio burst emitter. Plus the pulsar would have to be dancing a lot for it not to be constantly being seen, the yeah. FRB coming from the one spot. Exactly. That's the, that's the, other, the other, other big difference is that the, we see the pulsar emission repeat regularly and the fa fast radio bursts are there once and then they're gone. But at the same time, my uh, hunch is that fast radio bursts are coming from what I call a compact object either a neutron star or a black hole. We know it has to be coming from something quite small just because the duration of the bursts are so short. You can't have a, a big object produce very short things. So it would either be some sort of a very uh, intensely magnetized neutron star or you know, uh, something to do with a black hole. Could and it be a type of glitch in a neutron star? That's a very interesting question. Uh, people have one hypothesis for a fast radio burst more tied to the, the source that repeats is that it's caused by flares in what we call a magnetar. This mm. is a very highly, highly, very highly magnetized neutron star. So those flares can be associated, can cause glitches. So that there is a connection there. However, we know of many pulsars in our own galaxy that glitch. So when we describe a pulsar as glitching, what it means is that the pulsar has suddenly spun up. And it's done this because it's taken energy from the interior of the neutron star, which is uh, comprised of a superfluid, and transferred it to the outside of the star, which is the thing that we can see. So we've seen lots of neutron stars do that in our own galaxy. And none of them have produced a fast radio burst when that's happened. So I think that's one reason that that particular flavor of the hypothesis would be disfavored. However, if you have a glitch in a highly magnetized neutron star, these are, you know, super magnetized, thousands of times more magnetic than the average pulsar, all bets are off. What we know from these fast radio bursts now is that because they're coming from such 
far, far distances and the birds are traveling through the space in between galaxies that we can use that to really study this nearly invisible matter that's hard to see otherwise. This is this very uh, we call diffuse, very tenuous gas that's in between galaxies. And people have been, astronomers have been trying to understand where that gas uh, is. You know, is it close to galaxy clusters or is it very much more uh, evenly distributed? And we're now able to show that fast radio bursts are in fact probing that medium. And that's going to allow them to be a very useful tool in their own right. So even if we don't know what fast radio bursts are, we can still use them as a tool, which is great. So you're exploring the intergalactic medium by the dispersion caused through the fast radio bursts and learning more about, I guess, the what the, the electrons and protons that are floating around yeah. in there, the cosmic rays, whatever they are, that are um, hovering around in the in the space between the stars and galaxies and galaxy clusters and superclusters. Yeah, 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 that's exactly exactly the case. This medium, you know, the, what we call the intergalactic medium or the cosmic web, is incredibly hard to study in any other way because it's just so diffuse. If you point a telescope and try to look for it, it's just almost impossible to see. What we do know is that a large fraction of the baryons, the normal matter, this is the protons and electrons, is in this medium, but we can't see it. So this has been one of the outstanding open questions in astronomy. It's the so-called missing baryon problem. Oh, the 5%, so, yeah. So if we can find these missing baryons, we know they're there. We know they're somewhere. But with this fast radio burst, we're going to be able to see exactly where they are. Are they just hovering outside of galaxy clusters? Or are they more evenly spread out? We can use properties of the fast radio burst to study how much magnetic fields there are in this intergalactic space. So it's a very exciting time, and this really opens up a new way to look at the universe. That's Ryan Shannon from Swinburne University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The European Space Agency's Bepi Colombo mission has blasted off on a seven-year journey to explore the mysteries of the planet Mercury. The 4,100-kilogram probe was launched aboard an Ariane 5 rocket from the Kourou spaceport in French Guiana on Ariane Space Flight VA245. A tour de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2... The roar of her engines, a lot of fire, and with a Bepi Colombo on board, the DDO says all is well. The two boosters now providing 90, that's 90 percent of our thrust, propelling the launcher along her trajectory at an ever higher velocity. 780, 780 tons at liftoff, that's the mass, and to get that sort of mass La off the ground, you need a nominal. lot of push, and push we have. She's burning five tons of fuel every second, two and a half tons being burned every second in each booster, plus the core stage burning another 300 kilos of fuel every second. Ariane 5 putting on quite a show. The sky is clear. Ariane 5 now following the program and the onboard computer, which gives all the orders, including stage separation. We'll soon see that in just about uh, 30 seconds from now. We are in the first of four flight phases. The first three are powered. Right now, the first flight phase, the single first stage engine, and the two boosters are burning. The boosters will each consume their 240 tons in just over two minutes, in just about 10 seconds. They will be the first to be extinguished, and you'll hear that from the DDO, the two boosters flaming out, and they will fall into the Atlantic. Signals from the spacecraft received at ESA's control center in Darmstadt, Germany, through their new Norcia tracking station near Perth, confirmed the launch was successful. Bepi Colombo is a joint endeavour between the European Space Agency and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA. It's the first European mission to Mercury, the smallest and least explored planet in the inner solar system, and the first to send two spacecraft to make complementary measurements of the planet and its dynamic environment at the same time. That's because Bepi Colombo comprises two very separate science orbiters. There's ESA's Mercury Planetary Orbiter, and JAXA's Mercury Magnetospheric Orbiter. The third component to the spacecraft is ESA's Mercury Transfer Module. It'll carry the two orbiters to Mercury using a combination of ion propulsion and gravity-assist flybys, one of the Earth 
two of Venus and six of Mercury before entering orbit around the rock closest to the Sun in late 2025. A fourth component is a sunshield module, specially developed by ESA to help protect the spacecraft from the blistering heat of the Sun as the probe draws nearer to Mercury and the solar environment. The two science orbiters will also be using some of their equipment during the cruise phase, providing unique opportunities to collect scientifically valuable data as they fly by Venus. And some of the instruments designed to study Mercury in a specific way can be used in a completely different way to study Venus, which has a thick atmosphere and dense cloud cover compared to Mercury's exposed surface. All in all, it means Bepi Colombo is one of the most complex interplanetary missions ever flown. One of the biggest challenges is the Sun's enormous gravity, which makes it difficult to place a spacecraft into a stable orbit around Mercury. In fact, the probe will need to constantly break to ensure a controlled fall towards the Sun, with the iron thrusters providing the low thrust needed over the long durations of the cruise phase. In fact, that's the reason why the journey is going to take seven years, rather than just a couple of months in direct travel time. Other challenges include the extreme temperature environment the spacecraft will have to endure. The temperatures soaking the spacecraft will range from minus 180 degrees Celsius to over 450, hotter than a pizza oven. Many of the spacecraft's mechanisms and outer coatings have not previously been tested in such conditions. In fact, the overall design of the four spacecraft modules also reflects the intense conditions they'll face. The large solar arrays of the transfer module have been tilted to avoid radiation damage while still providing enough energy for the spacecraft. The Mercury Planetary Orbiter uses a wide radiator to remove heat from its subsystems, as well as reflect heat and fly over the planet at lower altitudes than ever achieved before. The eight-sided Mercury Magnetospheric Orbiter uses a different approach, spinning 15 times every minute to evenly distribute the Sun's heat over its solar panels in order to avoid overheating. A few months before arriving at Mercury in 2025, the transfer module will be jettisoned, leaving the two science orbiters still attached to each other to be captured by Mercury's gravity. Their altitude will be constantly adjusted using the Mercury planetary orbiter's thrusters, that is, until the Mercury magnetospheric orbiter's desired elliptical polar orbit is reached. At that point, the Mercury planetary orbiter will separate and then use its thrusters to power itself down to an even lower orbit. Bepi Colombo will spend a year gathering data during its primary mission with a possible one-year extension. Together, the orbiters will make measurements which will reveal the internal structure of the planet, the nature of its surface, and the evolution of its geological features, including ice in the planet's shadowed polar craters, and the interaction between the planet and the solar wind. A unique aspect of this mission is having two spacecraft monitoring the planet from two different locations at the same time. Mission managers describe it as the key to understanding processes linked to the impact of the solar wind on Mercury's surface and its magnetic environment. Scientists want to understand how planets like Mercury can form and evolve so close to their host stars. Bepi Colombo will also study the planet's interior structure, its composition and the characteristics and origins of its internal magnetic field, all in the hope of finding out why Mercury has such a huge core in relation to its mantle. Popular hypothesis for now is that most of the matter was blown away in some massive planetary collision. Bepi Colombo will try and validate that hypothesis or prove it wrong. Scientists also want to understand surface processes on Mercury, such as cratering, tectonics, polar deposits and volcanism, and whether, as it appears, the planet really is shrinking. And they want to better understand the characteristics, structure, composition, origin and dynamics of Mercury's exosphere, its tenuous atmosphere, as well as its magnetosphere. The mission will also allow scientists to test Einstein's theory of general relativity in great detail, making very precise measurements of the spacecraft's orbit and position. In this way, Bepi Colombo will build on the discoveries and questions raised by NASA's Messenger Mercury mission, providing the best possible understanding of Mercury and the solar system's evolution to date. By the way, the name Bepi Colombo? Well, it's named after Giuseppe Bepi Colombo, the scientist, mathematician and engineer who first implemented the Interplanetary Gravity Assist Maneuver during NASA's 1974 Mariner 10 mission. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time.
as the Bepi Colombo mission speeds on its epic journey to the planet Mercury, two new studies are shedding light on when the rock closest to the Sun formed and on the puzzle of its chemical composition. Mercury is the least studied of the terrestrial planets and something of an anomaly compared to the other three, Venus, Earth and Mars. Firstly, it's very small. It's also incredibly dense with a massively oversized molten core compared to its mantle and crust. It also formed under chemical conditions which meant that it contains much less oxidised material than its neighbouring planets. The research suggests two factors may help explain why Mercury is so strange. Firstly, the planet may have formed very early in the solar system's history, directly out of condensed vapour from planetesimals. And secondly, there may well be more iron in Mercury's mantle than is suggestive by measurements of the surface. One of the study's authors, Thomas René from the University of Aix-Marseille, hypothesises that very early on in the solar system's evolution, planetesimals in the innermost region could have formed from reprocessed materials that were vaporised due to the extreme temperatures there and then subsequently recondensed later. René and co-author Bastien Brugger, also from the University of Aix-Marseille, were able to rule out a scenario in which Mercury formed from the accretion of planetesimals like the other terrestrial worlds. These planetesimals coming from further out in the solar system. That's because were that the case, there would have been more oxidised material in the makeup of Mercury than what's been detected. Early studies suggest that Mercury was very rich in iron and contains more sulphur than should be available from the material from which the bulk of the solar system formed. But since then, NASA's messenger mission has greatly improved science's understanding of the bulk composition of Mercury. Brugger ran computer simulations of Mercury's interior, investigating core and mantle compositions, and compared the results with the gravity data gathered by MESSENGER. The results suggest that Mercury has a dense mantle, which contains a substantial amount of iron. MESSENGER revealed very low abundances of silicate iron on the surface, which means the element would instead be present in metallic or sulphide phases. The authors think that the iron abundances of the mantle could be far higher than values measured on the surface. Their findings have been presented at the European Planetary Science Congress in Berlin. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Scientists have confirmed that anthropogenic climate change, that is, global warming caused by man's use of fossil fuels, is now so profound it's actually affecting Earth's spin. Planet Earth is not a perfect sphere. When it rotates on its spin axis, the imaginary line passing through the north and south poles, it drifts and wobbles. These spin axis movements are scientifically referred to as polar motion. Now, this is different from a drift in Earth's magnetic poles due to changes in the planet's geodynamo caused by the rotation of Earth's molten liquid outer core around its solid inner core. Measurements through the 20th century showed that the spin axis of the planet has been drifting by about 10 centimetres a year. That might not sound like much, but when you think about it over the course of a century, that's become more than 10 metres. Using a combination of observational and model-based data spanning the entire 20th century, NASA scientists have for the first time identified three broadly categorised processes which they believe are responsible for this drift. Firstly, there's contemporary mass loss, primarily from Greenland. Then there's glacial rebound. And finally, mantle convection. The study's lead author, Surendra Adhikari from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says the traditional explanation is that one process, glacial rebound, has been responsible for the motion of Earth's spin axis. But recently, many researchers have speculated that other processes could potentially also have large effects on it as well. So Adhikari and colleagues assembled models for a suite of processes which would be important for driving the motion of the spin axis. Eventually, they identified not one, but three sets of processes which are crucial, and the melting of the global cryosphere, especially Greenland, over the course of the 20th century, is one of them. In general, the redistribution of mass on and within the Earth, like changes to land, ice sheets, oceans and mantle flow, all affect the planet's rotation. As temperatures increased throughout the 20th century because of climate change, Greenland's ice mass decreased. In fact, a total of around 7,500 gigatons has melted into the oceans during this time. This makes Greenland one of the top contributors of mass being transferred to the oceans, causing sea levels to rise and consequently a drift in Earth's spin axis. 
While ice melt is also occurring in other places like Antarctica, Greenland's location makes it a far more significant contributor to polar motion. The study's co-author, Eric Ivans, also from JPL, says there are geometrical effects that if you have mass which is 45 degrees from the North Pole, which Greenland is, or from the South Pole, such as the Patagonian glaciers, it'll have a bigger impact on shifting Earth's spin axis than mass which is right near the poles. Previous studies identify glacial rebound as the key contributor to long-term polar motion. During the last ice age, heavy glaciers depressed Earth's surface, much like a foam mattress depresses when you sit on it, and as the ice melts or is removed, the land beneath it slowly rises back to its original position. At the same time, that water flows into the oceans, and as the Earth spins, centrifugal force moves more of that water towards the equator, changing the overall shape of the planet. In the new study, which relied heavily on a statistical analysis for such rebound, the authors figured out that the glacial rebound is likely to be responsible for only about a third of the polar drift in the 20th century. The authors argue that mantle convection makes up the final third. Now, mantle convection is responsible for the movement of tectonic plates on Earth's surface. That's basically the convective circulation of material in the mantle caused by heat from Earth's core. Think of it as being like a pot of soup placed on a stove. As the pot heats up, the pieces of the soup inside the pot also begin to heat up, and they then rise towards the surface, where they cool a little bit and then sink down again, where they're again heated, causing them to once again rise, and so on and so forth. Essentially, it forms a vertical circulation pattern, just like rocks moving through the Earth's mantle. With these three broad contributors now identified, scientists can distinguish mass changes and polar motion caused by long-term Earth processes over which humans have little control from those caused by climate change, which humans are totally responsible for. They now know that as Greenland's ice loss accelerates, polar motion likely will too. Their findings are published in the journal Earth and Planetary Science Letters. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now for a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has shown that eating vegetable nitrates, found mainly in green leafy vegetables and beetroot, could help reduce your risk of developing early-stage age-related macular degeneration, one of the leading causes of blindness. Researchers with the Westmead Institute for Medical Research studied over 2,000 adults aged over 49, following them for 15 years. The research showed that people who ate between 100 and 142 milligrams of vegetable nitrates every day had a 35% lower risk of developing early-stage age-related macular degeneration, compared to people who ate fewer vegetable nitrates daily. It's the first time the effects of dietary nitrates on macular degeneration risk has been measured. Spinach contains approximately 20 milligrams of nitrate per 100 grams, while beets have nearly 15 milligrams per 100 grams. One in seven Australians over the age of 50 show signs of macular degeneration. Age remains the strongest known risk factor, and there's no known cure. Scientists with the Australian National University have developed a new flexible semiconductor which could bring bendable smartphones and televisions a step closer to reality. The new semiconductor uses a hybrid structure comprising a single atom thickness of carbon and hydrogen, together with inorganic materials just two atoms thick, to efficiently convert electricity into light for high-resolution displays on mobile phones, televisions and computers. Researchers say ultimately the new semiconductors could make cell phones as powerful as supercomputers. Back in 2016, researchers described a 3.7 billion year old fossil structure in Greenland as possibly being the world's earliest evidence of life. That claim, if proven, would bump fossils from the Western Australian Pilbara region out of the record books as the oldest life forms ever discovered. But new research, reported in the journal Nature, has cast doubt on the Greenland fossils being biological suggesting instead that they're simply rocks that have been shaped by geological processes and not a sign of early life. Well, if like me you've had sudden computer software issues in the last week, you'll be interested to know that a new Microsoft update for Windows 10 is being blamed for making files suddenly disappear and documents delete. Complaints about the issue have forced the software giant to pause its October update and investigate the matter. The company is now recommending that affected users contact Microsoft directly, 
and those who are manually downloading the October update should hold off for now. The problem of fake news is continuing to spread across the internet thanks to the growing influence of social media. It seems people are finding it easier to simply rely on stuff being pumped onto their screens, often by vested interest masquerading as real news, rather than by traditional trusted news agencies and networks. But then again, the so-called traditional news networks are also being accused of showing bias in their coverage. Even the once great ABC, whose charter is designed by law to enforce an independent and unbiased news service, is often accused of pushing a very left-wing agenda, with the latest essential poll showing that only 40% of Australians believe ABC News reporting is unbiased. So, if professional journalists are blurring the lines and pushing an agenda, it's even harder for non-professionals to know the difference between real and fake news, a problem Facebook, despite all its efforts, is also failing to deal with. To find out more, we're joined by Alex saharov Royt from IT Wire. Well, look, I mean, the, the problem is that it's, it's hard for, for Facebook to uh, have an algorithm that is trying to stop people from sharing content. I mean, one of the things that happened with Facebook's own data breach was that uh, journalists were putting up stories about Facebook's data breach and Facebook's algorithm was saying, oh, we think this is potentially fake news. So it's, funny a, it's a difficult thing. Funny that, yeah. Now, you've got uh, Facebook working with both the Democratic and Republican Institute. Now, they, these organizations are only you know, loosely aligned with the actual organizations themselves. But look, Facebook is trying to make sure that its website is not a conduit for fake news. But by the same token, it has to respect the whole concept of freedom of speech. And uh, it's a tough thing. And we've seen how foreign entities have manipulated people into thinking that certain posts about President Trump or any number of things were coming from people in the States when they were being sponsored, allegedly, by the Russians or, or other people. So it's an ongoing fight. You know, probably the lesson to be learned here is don't get your news from Facebook. <laughs> get it from real media sources where, um, in theory, those guys have a reputation. But then, of course, you've got the real media sources that are being alleged to be doing fake news themselves. So, you know, you really have to read widely and use your best judgment. It's a long, long held fact. Don't believe everything that's on the internet. And yet people are still fooled all the time. Well, there's a sucker born every minute, as they say. Yes, P.T. Barnum was right. And that report by Alex of royt from IT Wire. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.